Hi guys, thanks for coming this morning, or it's, it's my afternoon very much, so I've, I've been up since about four o'clock today. Um, so my presentation is called Software is Eating the Enterprise, and some of the topics may well have come across in the last couple of days, but I hope the way that I've presented some of the things might be at least something that you guys can take away. So also it might be a bit confusing because uh, on the printout it said I work at M&S, which is a big retailer in, in the UK. Uh, obviously my deck now says uh, something very different, so I'll explain that in a second. Um, so I've got 30 minutes to go through about 60 slides, so it's going to be like a rapid fire um, presentation. I'll probably skim through some of it, but um, bizarrely I actually managed to get this domain name a few years ago, enterprisedevops.com. So if you go there, you can download my deck um, and feel free to have it on your laptop as I'm, as I'm going through. Um, so very briefly about me, so 2011 I joined m as the start of a big program of work to replatform their website and pretty much uh, a lot of the back-end systems as well. So it's about a 150 million pound project. Um, and, and the company really at that point was very good at big projects, very much waterfall. Uh, and I was brought in from these startups. I don't know if these are familiar to you guys in the US. Um, pretty much their revenue is about 100 million each, but uh, M&S was more like 10 billion. So I was brought in to be the kind of agile guy back, back then when people didn't really know what the, what the A word meant. <coughs> So the purpose of my presentation today is really, fair enough, I used to work for a company that was 10 billion pounds, uh, 10 billion revenue. I'm now working for one which is uh, considerably smaller and four years old. Um, but what I found really interesting and why I think it's still relevant is that everything I learned whilst at Marks & Spencer, I'm applying every day in my startup. Not my startup, but the startup I work at. So quickly on M&S. So I was there for three and a half years and um, Bizarrely, I just kind of created a DevOps team within this big organization because I started to do stuff. I was really brought in to be kind of the dev guy doing the governance on this big program. Um, but actually, we, over the period of time, we kind of rebranded ourselves and we got rid of the name DevOps for a while, came back again. But essentially, what we were trying to do was just make the whole organization better at doing software engineering. The team itself across, uh, across the world was about 650 people, um, a lot of them testers. <laughs> I think about half of them were testers. Uh, which is bizarre. Um, and we were modifying and building um, 65 apps. So there's lots of dependencies between these apps. Ultimately, the project was successful, went live in February this year. Um, and I think the underlying success of that is lots of different reasons. But one of, the, one of the key things that people didn't really realize is we always knew where the code was. We always knew where, which build was in which environment. We always knew who checked in the code and why and which component was related to another component. So people didn't really have this big issue of, oh my god, we got into this nightmare sitting integration phase where we don't know what actually we're testing. It was all very smooth and we knew what we were doing along the way. <clears throat> and I kind of set the scene that I was trying to agile enable Marks and Spencer because it was a pretty much a big iterative waterfall, bit of scrumful kind of project. But everything behind the scenes that we were doing would enable us to be product teams and agile in the future because we'd have all that foundation in place. So quickly moving on to Cambridge Satchel. We make things like this, um, handmade in the UK. So we're, we have the same problem, actually, that Marks & Spencer has. We have the same components on our architectural diagram, but we just have it at a very different scale at the moment, some of which I'm going to build my own, some of which I'm going to go into the, into the cloud. But essentially, the, the architectural diagram is exactly the same, and the challenges in terms of retailer, picking up in store, shipping to store, buying on the web, is exactly the same, whether you're 10 billion or 10 million. So I've joined in the last six weeks, in fact, um, after a bit of funding, $20 million from Index, to move this company from 10 million to 100 million in the next three years. So it's fantastic for me. I've got a clean sheet of paper in terms of technology, and the lessons learnt at Marks & Spencer's and the DevOps journey that we've been on are actually making me change the strategy of how I'm gonna go about building our technology. So as part of the, this deck, I've got 10 uh, quick points. I'll try and uh, get through them as quick as I can. So the first one, over communicate your plan. So I found myself at Marks and Spencer um, drinking a lot of coffee and going to lots of buildings and talking about the same thing over and over again. You know, what were we doing? Um, I think the previous presentation was saying a similar thing. You know, you need to really explain why you're, why you're sort of doing this DevOps thing. What does it mean to the business? Um, I'm very much a, a whiteboard guy with uh, uh, Sharpies and, and whatever. So I always had a back pocket of these things and back pocket of diagrams that I could explain. You know, when, whenever I was anywhere, I'd be 
the first person to get my A3 printout and say, you know, this is what we're doing, this is what it's all about. Um, and people started to take notice. They were like, okay, this is the guy who seems to be really interested in the code and the software engineering stuff. And actually, we outsourced that a while ago. So this is really interesting that someone's now talking about it and quite obsessed about it. So I got my team to kind of be uh, very similar in that way. Um, I don't know if any of you guys saw the presentation from uh, Stephen Fisherman, I think, uh, yesterday from Autotrader about trying to talk to uh, different people in the organization. You might have people that are a bit threatened. There might be some people who are like desperate to learn. And you have to really reach out and make those friends because you'll need them in an enterprise to try and uh, call, on, call on some favors uh, over time. So this is some of the diagrams. That one on the right, so on the left, is the one that I'll go through a few times in this presentation. But all the time, I was trying to make it visual. You know, how can we explain what this DevOps thing is about? Because the minute we mention DevOps, people are just rolling their eyes and kind of not listening. So I was like, OK, I'll show you a nice diagram. Uh, maybe that will explain what we're talking about. I also stood up in front of the big program on the, you know, on the big day of reckoning when everyone got together. I was like, let's start this three-year program of work. And for some reason, I don't know where it came from, I was like, it's all about the code. When they asked me, you know, Johnny, what, what are you doing? It's, it's all about the code. We're all here to write code, ultimately. Um, and that stuck with me, uh, stuck with me for about three and a half years. I was always from the senior guys, oh, it's all about the code, Johnny, you know. It's like, yeah, yeah, I know I said that like three and a half years ago. But it really is from application code, config code, test code, test data. We were all getting up and going to work, basically, to help those developers offshore write some good code and to control what they were doing. Um, I had a few arguments with people about that, but that's very much my view. Um, but what I didn't mention really back then was the team. So it's about the code and how good your technology is, but it's also about how good your team is. Um, and this is a, a kind of format that I pulled together. So I don't know if you can see around the room. room uh, again, feel free to download it. So along the bottom there is the kind of capability within software design and architecture. And the other direction is the team, how good the team is, the process, et cetera. It's very similar to the electric cloud version yesterday, but I can only think in two dimensions. So this is what I was sort of communicating. So if you look, the speed of delivery is kind of towards the top. So if you're in the top right-hand corner, you're that kind of U word. I won't even say it. I think everyone's heard it too many times this last couple of days. But you're pretty good at getting software out if you're up there. And you've probably got really good technology, and you've probably got a really good team, probably paying them the top 10 percentile uh, to enable that to happen. So if I flick through these, right at the end over here in the quarterly release cycle that maybe your enterprise might have, fundamentally, you've got bad working practices and bad software. It's hard to admit that, but even if you've got some great legacy developer writing some crazy code and he's fantastic, the fact that that software is dependent on 50 other systems, and there's no automated tests, and there's no automated builds, actually, in my view, makes that pretty poor software. Um, and the fact that these working practices are such that it's getting released every quarter is also not particularly great. So as you walk through the different, different scales, you get to a point where you've got great software and a great team. So I think you probably get that. So please understand this diagram, because I'm going to use it uh, throughout my deck. So then you come to kind of excellence and craftsmanship, <clears throat> I think someone else mentioned this uh, the other day. So we very much treated all of the stuff that we're building as a craft. You know, it's not a really boring subject, software engineering. It's a craft. And if you, very, if you treat it as such, um, actually, it's very beneficial for the organization. So the way I see it, getting a, a quarterly release cycle and that big inter integration phase, those very expensive environments with you know, IBM um, backends or, or whatever, you know, it's very expensive. And to get 30 applications all talking to each other with the right test data, with the right teams, and multiple people sharing these environments, that, that can go into hundreds of thousands of dollars, or even, I think, in some cases, like a million dollars for a real integration test environment. As you go up the stack, it's getting a bit cheaper because you're in the cloud, you've got all these things. You might have a really expensive team, but it's a much smaller team. You're not wasting your money on... Um, rework and the cost of building the, the wrong thing. So second, I probably need to speed up a bit. Um, I'll go through this quickly. So I had this issue where my team were, we were insourcing some of the devs, so most of it was offshore. 
but we were saying, well, we had a strategic direction to get some in-house talent to start to own a lot of this stuff and own some of the software engineering. So I was in the position where I had the, the developers on the ground wanting to do all this stuff. I had the senior board saying, yeah, these companies over here can release 10 times a day. We want some of that. And then everyone in the middle going, what, what, you know, what, the, what, what is this? And I was kind of in the middle there saying, this is what it is. Here's my diagram. Uh, let me take you for a coffee. Let me explain it. Um, but ultimately, it was around pace. So this is a diagram, very simple one, of an e-commerce system. Um, it's got a product information management system, an e-commerce uh, back end. It's got a finance system. It's got a front end and an app. So ask the board, you want to release 10 times a day, but do you really want to release all of this 10 times a day? Um, and I was struggling coming from a startup background thinking, I really uh, would love to do all this stuff. What, in my last company, we did all this kind of automation, but I'm stuck with this big thing. And I've got the board saying, we want to release this every day. So what we did was, uh, before Gartner really came up with their pace layering, we said, OK, we're going to do paces. So we're going to say, some of this stuff we're going to release really fast. Some of this stuff we're not going to release really fast because we can't. And actually go back to people and say, is this what you mean? Do you really want the back-end finance system to be uh, deployed every day? Do you really want that payment system that takes 10 billion pounds a year to be deployed every day? You probably don't. And you're probably happy with the governance and uh, systems to help that sort of compliance. So again, putting it on the, um, on the chart, you can then explain what you're trying to do. So yeah, we're going to aim right at the top there to get the front end really well architected. And we're going to try and release that every day. But we're not necessarily going to do touch the finance systems um, because that's just going to take us years. And of course, this will only really work if you've got good separation between these, these systems. And, and we, were, we were lucky at the time to have APIs between each real big system. Um, so you probably want to be here. But do you want to be there for everything? And I think if I was sat in some of these presentations earlier and saying, well, yeah, Everyone's doing all this stuff really fast. And I'm sort of thinking, yeah, some of it you can do really fast. And maybe some of it don't, don't bother right now. Um, and that's the kind of judgment you need to take and trying to, to be able to uh, explain it. So time for a bit of animation. There you go. Um, so really, are you going to try and move this entire stack in the right direction? Or are you going to leave some of it and, um, and uh, selectively choose where you're going to go? So this relates to kind of kill dependencies. I'm really going to have to speed up. Um, so again, the same diagram. This bit, uh, sort of the lower quadrant, if you want to call it that, is what I started to call the legacy zone. So that's the stuff that generally enter, uh, enterprises have. You know, they're, they're quite away from being this, uh, this company that can do really cool, funky stuff at the top. But it turns out that enterprises can do that stuff at the top as well. You know, there's no reason why they can't do that. It's just that that is probably a smaller app. Maybe it's something that's above an API, or maybe it's a, a, a mobile app or something that, you know, that can run in a completely different life cycle to everything else that you've built, built before. Um, and when we started to think like that, it was, it was really interesting. Um, so one, one of the patterns we started to look at was, OK, we've got this big ear file, for example, a big Java app we want to deploy every day. It's got so many dependencies, and it's got very little test uh, scripts or, or anything to really be able to do that every day. So why don't we just shrink that a bit and take out the bits that we really want to deploy every day and move that bit into the fast area. So actually, we moved to a model where this big e-commerce platform, we kind of kept where it was and produced a front end in a different technology that we could actually recruit for uh, that uh, enabled us to publish the front end kind of at will, in fact, more than 10 times a day. So remember, this is a company that's 130 years old. And suddenly, they've got bits of their application that they're getting out really fast. So I guess you've all seen this book, probably, um, The Lean Startup. And everyone in the whole organization, organization is saying, yeah, we want MVPs. Everyone wants an MVP. Yeah, let's do some little small thing here, and we'll get that out tomorrow. That's all very good and well if the product owner understands DevOps and understands the relationship between the bits of the application that will make up that MVP. So in this model, you've got the new funky little app that they want as an MVP up the corner there. But if you're not careful, it's got some dependency on some legacy application, and it needs to be tested with some legacy app. And then suddenly, you're in a, a, a non-viable product. You know, so you've got to choose something else to be your, your viable product. 
Um, I'll let you uh, potentially download these and, and look at it. Don't create new legacy. So I like the phrase, leave a legacy, don't create legacy. Um, so I feel I've left a bit of a legacy at m and and it's, uh, they're, they're at least doing DevOps and the board knows about it. And hopefully I didn't leave any legacy with me uh, with some of these new applications. So it's very easy to do that though. You kind of start a new initiative and you're saying, yeah, we're gonna do some test-driven development and we're gonna do some automated deployments. But then the project manager comes along with sprint four and says, you know what, we're running a bit late. Why do you just, just stop doing those, uh, that automation that I don't really understand anyway? Then suddenly the, the capability of the team is such that you know, they're no longer that agile team that was really good and could do a sprint and get it out the next day because they haven't got their, their, all their scripts updated. And then I've seen this happen. Suddenly that really interesting, let's do this really cool app has again got a dependency on some other system, a backend system. Then suddenly you've actually just created some more legacy because that has to go out on a quarterly release cycle with everything else. Um, I'll just skip through this. So for those who came in late, uh, you can download this at enterprisedevops.com, which is my, um, my link. Um, so this is an, another key one that I kind of distilled from my experience that it's definitely not just an IT problem. In fact, the IT part of it is the easy bit. In a big organization, you have these big project methodologies, and I turned up from Startup World, and there's all these acronyms that are you know, HLD, I, was like, I didn't know what HLD was. It was, a bit embarrassing to kind of say, can someone explain what HLD means? Oh, it's a high level design, oh, of course, right. Um, HR recruitment and reward. You know, at the very highest level, sometimes the, you know, the CIO has got the wrong structure, um, which is forcing people to kind of have the wrong behavior. And also reward. In a, in a large organization, it's very difficult to say, well, actually, for this agile team over here, we're gonna start paying them on the success of the team rather than individually uh, bonused and on a, some kind of bell curve. One of the key things is about the finance and pr procurement. Um, lots of tools that I wanted at the time you know, didn't come, up, come about because it wasn't corporate policy or there were particular reasons that we couldn't, uh, we couldn't find the money to, to, to actually get them. So again, you kind of got this equilibrium that everyone's trying to go up into that top right-hand corner but then potentially got the wrong hiring policy and you're not getting the people who actually know how to do that stuff or they're just not up for it. You've got the wrong team uh, objectives and the, the wrong third party. So your third parties might be on a, uh, uh, not, not on a time and materials basis. There may be no need for them to actually try and automate anything because they're, they're quite happy with 50 people doing manual tasks. Um, as I said, the wrong sort of contractual and financial frameworks Definitely the wrong technology choice. So in the e-commerce landscape, there's loads of big applications that you can buy, but none of them have tests, none of them have build automation, none of them have anything that actually makes you move into the top corner. So you've got to be really careful, and probably when you're thinking about what technology you want to bring in, you know, ask that question, do you, do you have those things available? So you are unique, think for yourself. So this actually I found quite interesting, because in London, this is kind of anti-pattern DevOps team. So everywhere I went, I was like, yeah, I've got a DevOps team. Uh, they're building DevOps capability. And people are like, Johnny, it's such an anti-pattern. You shouldn't have a DevOps team because you know, it's just not the done thing. I was like, okay, I'll forget that. I'm gonna have one anyway. Um, so we, we found like having this, this team that could create the Amazon accounts and not worry about that and get some of the Jenkins stuff installed and just do some of the framework behind the scenes that would then enable different scrum teams to have a head start, really kind of bootstrapping their, their kind of DevOps journey. Really helped us. Uh, I hear some people say, well, I'm gonna, you know, over time get rid of this team. But actually, these guys are doing a quite a solid job of just getting a bit of clarity on, on some of those tools that we're using. It's not to say you can't use other tools, but if, if this team are doing the right job, an individual scrum team will go, I'm going to use that because that's going to save me time rather than reinventing the wheel in my own way. And so think for yourself. So up in the top quadrant, there's loads of blogs and loads of things you can read about. As you go further down, it's much more kind of unknown. And I guess over the years, if this uh, conference continues, it'll become a bit clearer what's happening down there. But I guess what I'm saying is, 
there's an opportunity for us to really understand and learn and try things out because um, people just haven't done it yet. And actually, the enterprises are so complicated that you're going to have to make your own innovation around how you get DevOps to work in an enterprise. Um, we kind of felt our way through and I had a bit of a, a good situation that people didn't really understand what I was doing, so I could just get away with stuff. But in a lot of enterprises, you know, it's very locked down and individual roles are very kind of difficult to shift. But it's about kind of thinking, okay, there's all these cool people doing all this cool stuff, but I've got a really hard challenge. That's actually quite easy. I'm going to try and do something innovative, uh, you know, with my mainframe or something. Um, make your tools work for you. So I, I had every vendor on the planet probably come to me and say, oh, you've got this big program. You need these tools. Uh, and I spent a lot of time looking at most of them. So if you're interested in any tool, you know, feel free to drop me a line. I'll give you my verdict. Um, but ultimately, it kind of shifts you a bit. It might make your team a bit better. It might make your software a bit better because you now automated some stuff. But it's not going to solve your problems. The problem might be that you actually chose the wrong technology in the first place, or you need to think about refactoring it, or, or train, uh, train your team to, to be more agile. Um, another, cool th uh, another thing that we found was about tool sets. So I won't name any names of some of these enterprise testing tools or configuration management tools, but none of them fitted what I wanted. And I was fighting for about two years to just get my own tools, uh, which, by the way, were free. Um, which was um, interesting in itself. Um, and build a software factory. Again, I don't know about in the US, but in the UK, this idea of having a factory is quite, uh, what's the word? Um, it's not very popular, and it sounds a bit like, oh, you're trying to get these developers to be just a machine. But actually, what I'm talking about here is there's a lot of re repetition in setting up some of these systems and connecting these tools together. Uh, for me, that's just a factory, and it surprises me actually. You know, here's a a foggy U.S. traffic light. Um, but I think a lot of CIOs are kind of like, I've got all these teams, I've got hundreds and thousands of people, but I don't really know what they're doing other than this rag spreadsheet I get every Monday with different colours on it. Whereas for me, I want to know exactly what's going on, what the suppliers are doing, what they're checking in, how frequently we're building, what features are being de deployed. So for that reason, we went about. Um, creating this factory, so I'll just uh, skip to it. Um, I've got to thank this other company, Magentis, for these slides because I didn't do these ones. So essentially, it's you need some tools that control your requirements, and they have your maybe your wiki, so you keep all your documentation in one place. Um, we actually did a lot of behavior-driven development, so we've got a little thing there you probably can't see from where you sat. A tool that linked those tests and features and documentation together, and then something to actually build the code something to store your code and your binaries. And in an enterprise, you often have a lot of binaries that are third party. You know, whether you've got, you bought this system and this uh, third party updates it regularly, but you've got to treat that um, as if you own it as well. And you've got to config manage their binaries as well as your own uh, code. And then systems to run your tests. Um, this is where it starts getting a bit funky. So someone checks some code in, uh, and this master kind of application tooling we were using Jenkins, but there's many other things you could use, kind of triggers the need to build your code. Now, if you're in an enterprise, you've got lots of things being built. You can't rely on just one Jenkins box down here building all your code. So we, I was lucky that I had a team who were really into Amazon and Elastic, elastic uh, environments. So every time we wanted to do a build, we would build a, a kind of slave that was just doing this build job. So it'd run the build, it'd scan the code, and importantly for us, it would run uh, Fortify, which is a, a security scanning software, um, so that the security team were happy like from the minute we checked some code in that we were thinking about security from day one. Then you need something to run your test. So we had another kind of slave that said, right, what, what am I going to do now? I've got this build and I've stored this build. I'm going to run the tests, provision an environment, and then provision a test lab. So no one seems to talk about this test lab. It's not very much use having your test running on Firefox, you know, if you've got every other browser on the planet that's actually using your, your system. So for test lab, we, um, we actually use source labs and browser stack, I'm not sure if there are other ones. But essentially, you pass your test suite to them, and you say, run this on these devices and these browsers. And then the result of that can come back and then come back to your tooling and say, yep, 
um, we're, we're kind of good to go. Or in that case, something failed. And the beauty of this is that these are things that you've just spun up. Uh, and in that test environment, we would store all of the, um, all of the output of that, that device. So even if the test environment was then killed uh, and shut down, we'd have the logs of what happened when we were actually using it. So yeah, you can get rid of these things and maybe keep your test environment. So if you imagine the power of this for a tester, so there's a, requ a requirement that's linked to this feature file, which is your, your BDD specification. The developer checks in the code, it updates the ticket. It then kicks off a build that then updates the ticket to say, yeah, I built OK. It then kicks off your tests, which then says, yeah, that, that ran perfectly. And then what we had was a, uh, a way of putting in the ticket, the actual test environment to test in. Because my history of testing was that so many times a tester is like, hey, I finished my testing. Hate to tell you this, but you've come in early and went home late, but you've been testing the wrong environment. Um, and sadly, I've, I've seen that more than once. Um, so it's about having a full information about what you do. So this was the stack of things that we were, that we plugged together. And there's a few stalls upstairs, I noticed, that you can buy some of this kind of glue that does some of the stuff, whether it's as, um, quite, as, uh, quite the same as what we did, I don't know. But ultimately, these things down here, whether it's in, in my world in e-commerce, whether it's WebSphere, ATG, Hybris, or Demandware, or something else, you know, it's kind of irrelevant. The fact that you've got to test something, you've got to store your requirements, you've got to store your code, is kind of the standard thing wherever you are. And this was really important for our suppliers. So most of the code was written offshore in India, but uh, we forced them through our factory. So we knew exactly what was happening. Um, you know, you can do what you like in Delhi, but until that code comes into my code, and until I build it, and until I scan it, and until we package it, I don't really care what happened. And that really helped us control what was going on. And again, I think it was one of the successes uh, of that program. So I've started uh, this new role. I've got no technology. I'm building some. But the first thing I'm building is, in fact, this factory. Um, in fact, I, I can't see how you can work without one. You know, it's like uh, we're manufacturing code, and we need some way of handling it all. So um, it's certainly what, one of the first jobs that I'm going to be doing. A um, couple of minutes left. I mentioned uh, behavior-driven development. I don't know how many people here have come across it. Um, it's definitely quite big in London. Um, I think it probably originated there, a guy called Dan North. But quite honestly, I've tried Agile throughout my career, and it wasn't until I started doing BDD that actually everything started to fit together, and people were kind of doing automation all the time and forcing people to do feature files actually represented what we were trying to build and storing that feature file with the code, with the tests, so we were keeping everything updated. Um, I recently um, was looking at an e-commerce platform and they were saying, yeah, yeah, it's great now. We kind of support DevOps because we've got this thousand suite of Selenium tests that go with it. I'm like, okay, what about when I start changing that, that system? Oh yeah, well, that's up to you then. For me, that's like, that's no good anymore. The features, your tests, your data, your config needs to be sort of one whole um, that you can pull together. So last tip, prepare to be the enterprise of tomorrow. In fact, prepare to be the large enterprise of tomorrow. So that's my plan at Cambridge Satchel. Um, there are so many decisions that you can make that actually you end up, um, I'm not saying the enterprise is, is a bad place to be, but there are certainly things and decisions you can make today that will help you uh, in the future. Uh, I stole this diagram, so I probably need to put some uh, reference to where I stole it from. But this is just trying to show you know, the trajectory of trying to get this DevOps journey working um, does rely on a lot of coordination and, and thought. Otherwise, you just end up probably back where you started in, in legacy world. So for me in Cambridge Satchel, the, you know, it's a new world out there. There are SaaS platforms, etc. So the plan is to not even have these things to worry about. You know, I'm going to focus my team that I'm going to recruit on the front end, on the apps. I need to work on this order management system to sell the bags. So I'm going to move them into this space. So I'm going to make sure that we're really good at that. But all the rest, I'm just going to get off the shelf, uh, whether it's Salesforce, Zendesk, whatever. You know, I don't want that problem, because I want my team to focus on the, on the top bit. The things I'd like help on, test data in complex environments. I haven't really seen anyone do that really well. Um, also, behavior-driven development. Um, 
you know, how do you make sure that everything stays in sync at all times? And this whole idea of this DevOps factory, you know, I'm about to go out and build it again for myself. If anyone has already built it or there's a way of just buying one, let me know that isn't, you know, millions of pounds. And that's it. Thanks for listening. Um, as I said, I've got a blog which no one really ever goes to, although it's quite a good domain name. Um, <laughs> but you could download this deck from there, and I'd happily uh, take comments or you know, email me. Um, I'm really fascinated by the subject and would love to help you guys out and, and likewise uh, share experience. Thank you. Thank you.